You're on Vision Christian Radio. It's Neil with you, the Monday edition of 2020. And I know you're going to enjoy the conversation over this next hour as we talk about seasons in relationships. Our attention to seasons as we go through those with not only our marriage, but those close relationships uh, that might be uh, people who've been friends, perhaps even for decades. Well, our special guest today is offering some insights for us into getting relationships back on track by helping to navigate the changing seasons of our lives. She says our relationships can move from springtime, which we might feel as being new and fresh and fun and exciting, to summertime uh, that she describes as the fullness of that relationship, a fruitful time in that relationship. But rather than happy ever after, Peter Sork here says it's a challenge for many that summer seasons can sometimes move to autumn and even to winter. When things feel stale and when we struggle to know how to adapt and keep our relationships strong. Peter Sork here is our special guest through this coming hour. Peter is a former pastor, now a Christian therapeutic life coach who leads a ministry called Peter Empowering You. Peter Sork here, a special welcome back to 2020. Thank you for having me, Neil. It's always lovely to chat with you and the listeners. Peter, let's talk about um, seasons. Uh, you're talking about them. We'll call them a metaphor, the way we can talk mm. about the things that we're also familiar with and apply those things to our lives. Uh, these seasons, which you say starts with a springtime, then summer and autumn, then winter, uh, give us your insight here into why you've chosen to talk about relationships like this. Mm-hmm. I was thinking about the relationship with a friend who's just passed away. And as I was preparing something to speak at her funeral, I was thinking about the changing times and years that we were friends and how there were good times and not so good times. And then I just began to think about, yeah, it's a bit like the seasons of our lives. We go through stages and I just was looking for the right word and I just came up with seasons because of the different stages and I thought when I thought about seasons but there's good ones and there's bad ones if you look at spring summer autumn winter cold I live in Melbourne so it's a bit chilly in the winter and then the freshness of the summer and and springtime season so I began to compare those seasons with the seasons of my friendships and friendship in particular, and then I thought about just generally friendship. So that's where it came from, Neil. I was trying to find something to put into words how our relationship had changed, and then I began to think about, yeah, those seasons of the year. Hmm. Well, I want to ask you all about the wonderful relationship you had with what you might even call a lifelong friend, And you Mm. lost that friend recently. But uh, before we Mm. do, uh, we're talking seasons in relationships. And sometimes we're thinking about uh, the romantic relationships we have and the marriage that we've entered into. But do Mm. these sorts of principles, do you think, are they just as applicable if you're going through seasons at work? Um, Mm. And then, you know, they'll probably get into somewhere down the track, you know, the seasons of our relationship also as Christian believers, our relationship to God. So the seasons Mm. thing, does this, some of these things apply right across all of these different dimensions? Well, I think so, because just as I was waiting to come on to the radio and talk to you, I was thinking about, now, where will this go, God? (laughs) Where are we going with seasons? (laughs) And I began to think of all the different areas of our lives that can be compartmentalised, if you like, into seasons. And then I began to look up some scriptures about season and seasons and found that there are different seasons. For example, in Ecclesiastes, there are seasons, um, different seasons it talks about. There are a season for this and a season for that. So I think the Bible mentions it. Um, I think in the workplace, as you said, there's definitely different phases that we go through in relationships and even in our career pathway, we can start in one area and end up in a completely different area and go through different seasons in those areas. I know when I've moved from one complete different area to another, I've had to go through a sort of a 
a lost season almost to come through or even a winter to come to the other side of that in order to move to a new career or a new dimension of my career. Uh, interesting. Uh, I'm just thinking as you're describing those things, uh, can you actually engineer the season to be the way you think it ought to be? If you recognise you're in a winter <laughs> season, uh, do you just wait for a season change like you might do on a calendar or can you actually you know, be the one to be proactive and you can actively move to change the season? Uh, how, how do you think that mm. might work? Gee, that's a good question. I think there's perhaps a bit of both. I think the season's just going to change sometimes as a result of God's orchestrating your journey. But we know that we have a relationship with a big God who is listening to our prayers and who is standing with us in whatever we're in. So I think that we can be a partner with him to change things if the season is particularly feeling or looking bleak. Now, come back to your friend. You lost a very close friend just recently, and mm. uh, I wonder if you can uh, share some of the, uh, you know, the the intimacy of your friendship over many decades, mm. and uh, and and some of the seasons that you experienced there. Mm. Yes. Well, we have known each other this year fifty one years, so it's a long time. Wow. And we were best friends in those first years. And then there was a, so I'd call that maybe spring when we were getting to know each other and it was bright and airy and fun. And then as we settled into our friendship, our relationship was pretty comfortable, but it was good and that I would call summer. And then there was a season where it started to turn a little bit. Uh, we'd finished our studies and I was overseas for many years in my 20s and she was still in Melbourne and she, at one stage she came to visit me in the country I was in and we were doing this big road trip it was New Zealand actually and um, at, in your 20s Neil I don't know if you remember your 20s I certainly do <laughs> I try to forget <laughs> I think them. I've well I think you. we can all uh, you know there's some sometimes there's you know your your, your springtime years so uh, you might be thinking of as your 20s okay yes yes <laughs> So in our 20s and maybe pre and teens, we were very interested in the opposite gender, the opposite sex. And somewhere in our travels around New Zealand, we met up with a couple of, um, you know, pretty good looking Canadian boys. And unfortunately, that came between our friendship and our journey. So our journey was, was abruptly finished together when she went off with the Canadian boy and I went off by myself. Um, there was a Canadian boy for me, but I didn't fancy going off with him. <laughs> okay. So that sort of soured. And I guess you could say that became pretty quickly a, an autumn to a winter season, which did change our relationship. And although we were still friends, because there were a group of us that caught up for all our significant dates and engagements and all that, and she was certainly in that. And we were still friends, but it had cooled um, until – Maybe 20 or 30 years later, I don't recall when, but I do remember the, the visual of it. She came to me and she said, Peter, I just found that when I was moving a letter that you wrote to me after New Zealand. And she said, I read it and I didn't, I don't think I've read it before. And I'm really sorry for what I did. It was terrible. So a new season developed, Neil, where she was able to, apologize and so that closeness it perhaps never got back to right back in the beginning spring or summer in the early years but certainly that closeness was back so it's a changing thing that i think if we recognize it that our seasons are going to change and be patient and pray and trust god good will come you know the thought of being blinded by romance uh and then seeing your friends who you might think is best friends forever, uh, something happens and uh, romance can blind you and all of a sudden your friends who you really ought to be holding tight to can feel like they're expendable because maybe the romance mm. takes uh, some mm. sort of priorities and I can sort of hear that sort of thing coming into your experience with your good friend. Mm. Mm. Um, you've mentioned a very key word there, and that is blinded. 
And of course, science tells us the the neuroscience, when we look at the brain and look at uh, functional imaging, uh, when people are looking at images and their brain is being scanned during this time, so it's all happening at the same time, uh, people they love or good looking people of the opposite gender, um, we are actually blinded. There's parts of our brain that shut down. So when we are in love, that first you know, gush of love and, and romance and all of that and the honeymoon period when you're first married, there are parts of our brain that shut down. That's part of the logical area in the um, prefrontal lobes. So that's meaning that we don't see their faults and if we see them, we negate, we just discard them. And of course, as we know, in any relationship, but particularly marriage, after a certain time, all of a sudden the blindfolds come up, come off and you can see who you married and you wonder what you've done, maybe, hopefully not. <laughs> um, but yes, so we can be blinded and it's something to just acknowledge if you are in that first fruits of your marriage or of your relationship to know that, hey, there might be some things about him that are, or her that are going to really annoy you down the track. So it's good to try and be aware, but know that it's pretty hard to do that. <laughs> Coming back to your good friend, though, um, and acknowledging that she treated you badly on your visit to New Zealand, um, the I'm sorry, how powerful was that when you had you know, gone through perhaps mm. a winter uh, season mm. with your friend because mm. of what happened on mm. your holiday. Um, mm. uh, did the I'm sorry cause the relationship to just blossom to life once mm. again? Mm. Mm. Look, it was a, a real game changer. We were now mums, so we had families, so life was very different to the first time, early days of our friendship when we were very young, and we were good friends and we had all the time in the world to be friends except for our studies. But uh, it did change and it did definitely bring something very powerful to it, our relationship. And the fact that she came to me specifically to talk to me about this thing, she could have just sort of swept it under the carpet, not worried about it, but she made a point of apologising. So it meant a lot to me. And yes, it did bring us back into a new springtime, a different type of springtime. One where we didn't have a lot of time to share and be with each other, but certainly it, it it swept away the cobwebs, if you like, and it swept away the bleakness of that earlier time. And because you have a Christian faith, um, perhaps you relate differently when these things happen as well, because when your friend says, I'm sorry, as a Christian, uh, we will often follow that up with, well, I forgive you, and... And what words you use to do that, they might differ. But in some sense, because you have a Christian faith and you have something modelled in Scripture, you have a way of getting a relationship back on track. Is there a real benefit there in having that Christian faith and knowing how forgiveness works and all of a sudden mm. a new friendship uh, blossoms to life that looked like it was done mm. for? Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's a very interesting thing you've brought up because at the time my friend wasn't a Christian and for most of her life, she wasn't. But towards the end of her days, um, I'm believing that from our discussions, she actually did have a faith. But at that time, she wasn't. So, of course, when she apologised to me as a Christian, I was relieved that, hey, we've broken the ice and that I can forgive her, knowing that in my heart, some time ago, I had. However, had I done anything to really build that friendship again, up again. No, I hadn't. Why? Maybe it was busyness. I don't know. But that just was the thing that really did break the ice again, the fact that she came to me. But Neil, many times in our relationships when they fall down, as Christians, we are to forgive. The Bible is very clear. As we forgive, we are forgiven. And if we don't, we're not. So it is very clear for us to make that decision and do it even when it feels almost impossible. So I had done that, but it still meant a lot and it did do something special to our relationship. If she had never come to me and never said, I'm really sorry about that, um, I think we would have eventually got back to where we were. And I think 
the listener, we, we all need to know that some people are not going to apologise. Some people have passed on and they can't apologise. Some people are far away and we can't see them or don't have any contact. But as Christians, it's important for us to do it. And you know what I've found when I've helped other people do this in ministry and when I've done it myself, there's a releasing process that happens when you forgive someone. There's a releasing over our lives and there's a releasing over their lives. And so something happens, and I, I can't exactly explain it except something happens in the relationship spiritually. Maybe it's a three-way thing, you know, with God, them and us, you know, and something happens where there is a release in the relationship and in the relationship with the Lord. I've seen it countless times. So it's important to do it and let God do the miracles as a result of that. Peter, let me ask you this. Do all relationships start out on springtime? Um, Let's assume that, you know, that's where the green shoots and the freshness begins. Uh, Springtime has to be the starting season, doesn't it? Mm, It should be, shouldn't it? But, gee, that's that's, um, made me think. I think that some relationships don't start that way. I think that sometimes you get sight of someone and you take an instant dislike to them for some reason they, <laughs> they're doing something or they're saying something that that we judge or we take offense to and so instead of building on that relationship it's starting from the back foot so it could be it could be an autumn or a winter season and then it's difficult to bring it back into a different season and i think it would take an effort and being proactive to do that and, and a purpose for doing that. Hmm, I think it would be hard, though. Well, there might be listeners who can make a contribution there. Uh, the relationships that you think have blossomed over the years, did they start in spring or did they start maybe even in a wintry season? Uh, so 1-800-316-316. Of course, if you're in a wintry season and we talked about you know, how these things might develop and probably the likelihood is that winter comes when things go stale, uh, but uh, persevering through that wintry season People are very much disposable in their relationships these days and uh, cut people off. But is it worth being the person who perseveres through the winter season so that another springtime comes to life? Uh, Any thoughts here about that perseverance issue? Mm, Perseverance. Oh, boy. Um, Yes. (laughs) Yes. Have a think about God and how he perseveres with us when we do the wrong things, when we fall down. And what's that called? It's called grace. Grace for the times when we are not seeking God, not being proactive about our relationship, maybe even falling into sin, but we still have a Father God who is waiting for us and he's waiting to run into our arms. So he's persevering with us. And so when our relationships fall down because somebody has sinned or done something wrong, I think it's important that as Christians we receive that from the Lord so that we can overflow that to others. Taking calls, 1-800-316-316. Let's hear from Bill in Victoria. Hi, Bill. Welcome along. Oh, hello, Lee. Hello, hello Lee. Peter, and hello, the uh, John, is it? Neil, John? Neil. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Neil. Sorry, Neil. Yeah, look, I, I just wanted to... Um, Thank you for for your input. Um, just in terms of in, in Genesis, it talks about how God made made man and woman in His own image. So I, I don't see it just as Father God. I see it as Mother and Father God. Sometimes I get more more love from my mother than I do from from my father. Sort of thing. Father used to bash me. But going into the frozen season, you know, when when Jesus was on the cross, being beaten and persecuted, he was still praying for his people who were putting on the on, on the nails and stuff. Like sometimes people turn turn against us and become our enemies and and Jesus said still love your enemies so sometimes I find if there's just one glimmer of thing I can focus in in terms of someone who's really done the wrong thing or find I'm wanting to hate or what you know focus on one positive thing and keep praying about it persevering that hopefully with God's help we can you know restore or heal or or stop me from hating that, that sort of thing. So can you comment about that, please, Peter? Just the, the frozen seasons. Uh, Peter, thoughts here? Frozen seasons? Yeah, frozen season. That's that's a good season there, Bill. Thanks for bringing that 
season up. I guess that's in winter and it's really the deep freeze, isn't it? It's really the Arctic season within the winter season. And yes, um, Jesus from the cross said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And so true, so true. He was able to pray and release those people and forgive them and, and pray for their forgiveness. And we are to do the same. So, Bill, I really commend you that what you do is you focus on a glimmer of something, something that you can stop. And you mentioned stop you from hating people or hating them. So I really do commend that you are doing really the Lord's work and trying to build that bridge and trying to bring a new season about by not repaying evil for evil, but repaying evil for good and loving your enemies. So good on you, Bill, and thanks for sharing that. And Bill, just to uh, just to come back to uh, you know you started uh, your uh, thought there, uh, just saying you had a bad relationship with your own father, and uh, the reference you made, you know, thinking of God as mother and father God. Um, it's an interesting concept for people to grapple with, but um, just to to bring. A little clarity there, because I know people have this sort of debate, and it sort of goes along a little bit with some of the challenging uh, ideological debates that are going on within our society. But uh, interesting one to come back to, just for people making sense of that. Uh, what we do is we allow God to choose his own pronouns. And while he has uh, said all sorts of things, like, you know, being like uh, the hen who wants to gather her chicks under her wings, and there are some sort of feminine ways that we can talk about God. Ultimately, God has revealed himself as our Father. And so he is our Father God, and we say God is big enough to choose his own pronouns, as he has done throughout history. So, but Bill, thank you so much for your insights and uh, for uh, leading us through those thoughts. Uh, Bill in Victoria, appreciate you being with us. Peter, let's come back to the scriptures here, because we glean such absolutely priceless wisdom from Scripture in regard to seasons. Uh, what have you been reflecting on as you're uh, talking about these seasons in relationship when it comes to Scripture? Mm. Mm. I love the Scripture in 2 Corinthians 9.10 where it says, Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. So the Lord is talking to us about seasons in the sowing of our seed and how fruitfulness comes when we are righteous. So as we sow in a season maybe of bleakness even, we might be in a, a season where things aren't good. As we sow good seed, even in that bleak season, it will produce fruit he's saying that the lord or god saying as he supplies the seed we sow it and then bread is produced but it's up to us when we receive good seed and that's from the word from our fellowship with the lord from our christian walk our church preaching music whatever it is as we receive the seed we then sow it, and we sow it doing good things to people who might not be really doing good things to us in our relationships, but there is going to be a fruitfulness. He's saying to it, our fruits will be increased as we are righteous. So it's very powerful, that scripture. And so seasons are very much a part of that, and sometimes we think mm. about that seed being sown, and we think of it in monetary terms, but it's mm. a bigger, broader thing than that because, you know, Jesus telling the parable of the sower, of sowing seeds mm. onto various pathways. I mean, there's mm. a, you know, in the, in the right soil, there's going to be a hundredfold mm. increase. So uh, getting the mm. seeds sown into relationships uh, is going to bear some fruit in the longer run. So uh, some of mm. us are better at sowing seeds than others. And is, mm. is there anything practical here you've got as a thought, Peter, about mm. the sorts mm. of things that make good seeds sown into our friendship relationships into our marriage and our family because ultimately you're sowing the seed and at that moment you're not seeing the fruit, but the fruit will come. Mm, yes. 
Yes, what are good seeds? I think if you think about the fruit of the spirit, and again, we're talking about fruit as something that is grown <laughs> from seeds. So, so much of the Bible talks about sowing and harvest and, and um, that sort of farming um, agrarian culture because that was how they lived. But it's good for us in a practical sense because things that we can sow are the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And let's throw in some forgiveness because that's always good. So as we sow these good things in a season of darkness or bleakness or winter or whatever the season, and we are faithful in the sowing, it will produce good fruit because the word says that (laughs) as we sow, it won't return void. It is going to produce and we just have to be patient and faithful and in faith and, and trust God. Be nice to think that all of our relationships always remained in springtime and summer, but that's not always the case. Stay with the Bible for a few moments here because there are some other illustrations from the scripture. And I know you've given thought to the relationship between King David and Saul. Um, Mm. Give us an insight here, because that was certainly a long-term relationship that went through ups and downs, and you might even say had some seasons. Uh, Thoughts Mm. here around David and Saul? Mm. When I was thinking about seasons, again, in relationships, I thought, okay, biblically... What can I remember? And of course, my mind went to King David, who was uh, just a shepherd boy originally, and then he was chosen to be the king. But Saul was the first king, and he was in power, and he was the king. But Saul was sent um, a spirit that caused him to be anxious and worried and, and angry, And so David was on the scene during this time. And at the beginning, when Saul was a little bit out of sync, David would come and play music for him. So it was a lovely time in their friendship, in their relationship. It was really like a springtime. It was new, it was fresh, it was alive. Um, And then the summer season was the fullness of that relationship. But of course, unfortunately, then this spirit came upon Saul and he began to see David quite differently and he began to be fearful of him and think that he was after him or for whatever reason so he began to not to distrust him and of course then it went through that long season where he was out to kill him and David and his men had to go into hiding in the wilderness and uh, that was a long time but you know, what a story in that winter season, David was always faithful, even to the point where he could have killed King Saul when he was cut the hem of his garment, was able to prove to Saul that he wasn't after him. He came so close that he could have done him some damage in that cave where Saul went to relieve himself and David was hiding with his men. So no, he didn't do anything because he was honouring the man of God. And what a heart David had and of course we know that he had a heart after God and uh, that's why God loved him and that's why he chose him but yes so that season from springtime through to winter in the end it produced fruit went through to a summer season because David was faithful David was faithful with God and faithful to honor God's man King Saul and eventually it changed Uh, Winter, as Saul hated David, uh, was chasing him down, uh, was trying to kill him. (laughs) And perhaps uh, some of our relationships don't get to that sort of point. But here's a real winter, isn't it? Uh, A real wintry relationship. For those who are in a wintry time, and uh, look, sometimes it's actually with family members, Um, But, you know, we've been talking about close friends. Um, Yes, we've been talking about marriage too. Uh, But when you're in that really wintry place, um, it's easy to sort of give up hope. But maybe you're being pursued and you haven't got a chance to give up hope. You can't just discard that friend. Uh, Maybe they're pursuing you and the winter is so bad that you're actually almost feeling like you're under attack. I mean, you can't really give up in that space, can you? But I think you can take encouragement 
How do you how do you actually be encouraged when you're actually in a very wintry season right now, uh, with family, uh, friends, uh, workplace? You might even feel wintry with God. Mm. Yes, I think that when you're in that season, it is very hard. You are absolutely right, and it is it's bleak and it's hard to see through it, and our faith might drop and our hope with it. But I think the best thing to do, and this is what I do, is to be, to, maybe two things, be grateful for what God has given us. So it's therapeutically sound, scientifically sound, psychologically sound, and spiritually sound if we write down those things that we are grateful for that God has given us. So science tells us that this raises our levels of uh, emotion from depression into one of hope. So it's it's been tested and it's proved that writing down what we're grateful for. So gratitude is one thing that we can do. The other thing is to remember what God's done in the past. When we've been in other bleak situations, whatever they are, what has God done? How has he brought you through? What did he do and how did you get through it? And and what happened as a result, whether it be in a relationship or a situation, how has God brought you through? So remember the, the what you are to be grateful for now and maybe be grateful for what God's done in the past. Take us back to your relationship with your friend and uh, for listeners who might be just joining us as you were sharing about a friendship, a 51-year friendship and your friend has now passed away and uh, she passed away uh, when you were wonderfully restored in friendship, but you had a time where there was a, a bit of an estrangement over, uh, in over a romantic uh, relationship that happened with a Canadian man while you were on a New Zealand holiday. Uh, <laughs> listeners will have to go back and uh, you know hear the the whole story if you missed it earlier. But the sorts of things that you've learned that have inspired you to be writing about these things of recent times, uh, take us into some of these lessons that you learn in these seasons that you go through and uh, back to your friend. Mm, mm. As I was reflecting all this, and, and I actually wrote a blog which goes up shortly, um, I thought about my friend and and what I saw in her over this very difficult time of her illness which took 18 months um, and what I learned from her just in our friendship the ups and the downs in our friendship and I learned so much um, but particularly over these difficult months I learned from her that patience is a virtue my goodness how patient was she in that time and how strong and determined was she to hang on um, where she was given six to twelve months and she hung on for 18 months, mainly for family and friends. And and also I learned that she never looked back on what she didn't have. She just looked at the present and enjoyed her present moments. And so there were lots of present moments that her and her husband enjoyed, especially in those first months when she was still able to. So I've learned so much from that, watching her, watching her husband, how he navigated this. It was awesome. Um, and I guess also to not complain about what is bad. <laughs> What's wrong? She didn't complain. Can you believe that? And uh, she just kept on. I remember one conversation I had uh, with a friend. There's actually seven of us that have been friends for this time, and we lost one just over a year ago, and this is the second one. Um, and this another friend rang this friend that's just passed away, and she said, how are you going? And my friend on the phone said, super. <laughs> and that sort of knocked me because super she wasn't. Okay, if you'd look at her, you would not think she was super. But somewhere in there, there was a super spirit. <laughs> and uh, I'd had some very deep and meaningful chats with her about the afterlife and heaven and God. And uh, so I'm believing that she really was finding a new place to live. So I've learned a lot from her just to remain positive in the face of difficulty. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you, and taking things a little bit, maybe even into another dimension here, because uh, while we're talking about just the way relationships might 
naturally change. There's all sorts of things going on in our lives uh, from our younger years through our middle years into our getting older years. Um, there's all sorts of things that are changing. Women change. Uh, a lot of attention given to changing life uh, for women. Um, of course, things happen too when our children have grown up into teenagers and they're young people and they've left home and there's empty nests. Um, and then there's men who have all sorts of challenges uh, so far as careers go and, you know, what people sometimes make reference to as a midlife crisis, uh, all sorts of things like that. So there's lots of changing times in our lives, whether we're women or men, uh, that's affecting all of this just making things more complicated. How do you bring all that into the mix uh, here? Uh, I, mean, I don't know. Am I taking us too deep or in a different uh, dimension here? What are your thoughts here, Peter? Oh, you're right. Just speaking about women first, the different uh, seasons a woman goes through and the phases in her um, reproductive cycles. So that has a big effect on women, particularly around the, the changing time of seasons in the menopausal season. And that brings me to the biopsychosocial spiritual aspects of our nature, which I talk about all the time, um, because we are made up of different parts and we are biological, physical, biopsycho. We are psychological beings, biopsychosocial. We are relational and we are spiritual. So we are different parts or made into one and any of those changes in a different season that impacts all the others. So when our physical parts are changing, it's impacting our relationships, it's impacting us emotionally, it's impacting um, our health. And so the same with men, the midlife crisis and career changes, retirement, that's quite challenging for men. So that is impacting all those parts of them and their relationships. And then the teens, the empty nest, uh, for us, just a funny note on that, um, Neil, when our kids started to leave home, we just got more in. <laughs> we just got some international students. Right. So we've had them ever since. So we've had international students for 10 or 11 years. Um, as one left, we just got another one. And just, <laughs> so um, there's a new richness to our life in this season with international students as our children have left and we've become grandparents. So there's a whole lot of seasons in our relationships, in our physical body, in our psychological Things can happen psychologically, for, particularly for men, when they, they retire. And um, I read an article once about um, Olympians who are very focused on the goal, the Olympics. But if they don't have another goal, another season to go after and to head towards at the end of that Olympic season, they can fall into deep depression. So psychologically, we almost need to prepare ourselves for our next season and to be thinking about what is next god what uh, do you have for me where do you want me to go as i come into those retirement years what do you want me to do as the kids get into secondary school and start to have their own mind and become teenagers and as they leave what do you have so it's good to be consulting with the lord have mentors in the area that might people that might have gone through different things might be a little bit ahead of where you're at and uh, have a chat and yeah, just be considering the future. So if you're anticipating that change is coming, if, if you're in a spring season or a summer season now and everything seems to be rosy, you might anticipate that there could be a whole lot of factors that can turn those seasons into an autumn or even to a winter season. So anticipating the change, uh, I imagine that going on this pathway together uh, with people who might be affected by these anticipated changes in season uh, might be a very good way to, to think about how you do this as well. And I imagine just uh, broaching the conversation, opening up a conversation like this might be a valuable way to try and navigate the way forward. Mm. Yeah, especially if that is a, is a spouse or someone that's close to you in a workplace that uh, there's a new season coming up. So having that conversation about what it might look like and throwing some things up in the air and letting them settle. <laughs> Sometimes you need to do that. Just get them out and get them on the page, so to speak, and then let the spirit, your spirit and God's spirit, just sort of dwell around there and sit around there and pray into it. I, I think that's very valuable. But if you broach it with your spouse or workmate or kids about what that might look like, yeah, it just gets it 
out there. And I think that's important for us to be looking ahead. So do it with the people that you care about. Well, Peter, time's short now. Um, and, you know, oftentimes uh, people are, I, I imagine, uh, thinking through these sorts of things, you know, by way of being a couple or being a married couple. Um, this is where a lot of your ministry role comes in, uh, people who are uh, couples and uh, they're looking to you know, resolve some issues. They've moved into an autumn or a winter season and uh, we need a little extra help here. Uh, so for people who are in that sort of couples realm, you've got some, some new resources and you've got a blog that's going up tonight. Um, what, are, what are the sorts of things you're, you're going to be having to talk about in your new blog? Mm. So I'm talking about what we've talked about today. It's, I'm just uh, teasing it out a little bit. Um, in terms of couples, yeah, I do work with couples and uh, it's, oh, it's so fascinating to see couples come in in one winter, in a se- winter season of their relationship and then working through them to change, <laughs> to help them move back into a spring. And it really is like that because I use some... Um, I use some material that is psychological in nature and it's like building a house and you start from the bottom and build up the foundations again. You build up on the friendship that you had when you started but got lost somewhere. So it really is building the foundations and, of course, having God in there in those foundations so that you can start to build the house again. So um, people go to my website. I've got lots of blogs on marriage and couples and if they – want to talk to me about perhaps their relationship, just drop me a line through my website and we can perhaps um, connect that way. Well, connecting with Peter Sorkia, that's S-O-O-R-K-I-A, Peter Sorkia, uh, you can go to her website, peterempoweringyou.com. Uh, I mentioned you've got this new blog going up tonight uh, for people who subscribe before 5 p.m. Victorian time. They're the ones who are going to actually have the access to this new blog around the sorts of things we're talking about today. So there's a little encouragement there, peterempoweringyou.com. And uh, Peter, listeners today, they can follow you on Facebook too. And uh, and uh, so and you're, you're moving into different dimensions of relationships you know ongoing so uh, so for peter people to connect with you that's uh peter empowering you.com and you can follow peter on facebook uh, just to mention too peter's books unfrazzle and redazzle finding real peace god's peace freedom and beauty another book too called inquisitive a reflective journal finding meaning in the middle of your mess Peter Sorkia, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and your heart with us once again today on 2020. Thanks so much for having me, Neil. It's been an absolute pleasure. 